If you would, turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, please. 2 Timothy chapter 3. By way of introduction, if you don't know me, you're probably better off. (laughs) If you do, it's my chance to say I'm sorry. I'm sure I've said something to make fun of you or something over the years, so I publicly say I'm sorry. (laughs) But I'll probably do it again. (laughs) Today's message is called Equipping, Equipping People in Christ. And so for those who don't know, my name is Dustin Harris, and I've been the high school minister here at Cabot Chino Valley. February 1st was my 19th anniversary as the high school youth pastor here. So it's pretty cool. I started in September of uh, 99. And then uh, Pastor brought me on staff February 1st, 2000. And so it's been a blessing. And uh, it's such an honor to be with you guys this morning and and get into the Word. And so, you know, uh, our name for the high school ministry is Epic, Equipping People in Christ. And so when I was praying about what to teach, I was putting down a bunch of notes. And a few weeks ago, one of my friends was like, why don't you share your heart about Epic? And I was like... Why don't you do it? No, I... (laughs) And so, here we go. So let's pray. God, I just pray that you would speak to us. Lord, may my words be your words. May you be honored and glorified this morning. May your Holy Spirit come and speak to us. And Lord, may we not just hear, but Lord, as we go, may we apply your word. Lord, we want to be drawn to you. And Lord, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, real quick again, a little bit more about me. I, I grew up in the city of La Puente, and uh, I was the target. I was a white boy. I, was <laughs> I didn't grow up in a religious home. I, didn't grow up, I, I grew up in a high moral home. My parents are still married, praise the Lord, and um, happily, and, and I grew up in a great home. But it wasn't religious. We, I was raised like, if you want to believe in religion and practice, that's up to you. And when you're old enough to decide, you could. And so two weeks before 10th grade, we moved to Chino. One of the reasons was someone got killed in a drive-by on my street. And so we, we did. And growing up, most of the people that I was in contact with were Jehovah Witness, Catholic. A lot of people I knew didn't practice religion, but labeled themselves something of religion, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, we're Catholic. You don't go to church. Yeah, but we're Catholic. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Like, it was all titles. And so when I moved to Chino, I started at Don Lugo, and somebody on my water polo team invited me to uh, their youth group. I went, and the first week I went, the youth pastor showed a movie called Fear to Freedom. If you've heard of it, it's Life Story Pastor Raw. At the end, when he gives an invitation, my youth pastor turned it off and gave an invitation, and I received Christ as my Lord and Savior the very first time I went. Now, I didn't understand what it was I was doing, and so the next couple of Wednesdays, I had gone to the youth group, and they gave an invitation, and, you know, who wants to come forward, raise their hand, and all that stuff, and I did each time for three or four weeks in a row. And I was like, they're like, you know what you're doing? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> and so... Wes, one of the high school leaders, pulled me aside and uh, told me what I was doing. I said, I meant that the first week. And I just didn't know what it meant. I didn't know biblical terms and different things like that. And so I gave my life to Christ that first week and haven't been the same since. And since then, my family's come to the Lord, and before my grandparents passed, I was able to pray with them to accept Christ and many others. And so I've seen God do some amazing things in my family. But one of the things, when I was in high school, I didn't read my Bible, I didn't read textbooks, I usually cheated. I, <laughs> the only things I read in high school was usually Thrasher magazine, which is a skateboard magazine, and surfing magazines. And I didn't read, I didn't like to read. I finally got a Bible, and I, would, I, I thought Bibles were amazing. I was raised that, to respect a Bible. Matter of fact, all growing up, we had my great-grandma's Bible on our coffee table. But it was so precious to us, you don't touch it. You just keep it clean. You just, it's, it's, it's special. 
And it was my great grandma's. It meant everything to our family, so respect it, leave it alone. <laughs> but it wasn't until I realized the importance of God's word and being in it, because it transforms our lives. And you know, it's interesting, as we grow and as we contemplate life, we have questions like, what would Jesus do? Why is there evil and suffering? Where did we come from? What's gonna happen when we die? What does the Bible say about this or that? How should I respond to this? How do I control my thoughts? Is there an example in the Bible about this? How do I live as a married person? How do I live as a single person? What do you believe about God? How are your beliefs formed? Did you sit down and figure it out for yourself? Were you influenced by some person who did not believe in the Bible? What kind of foundation do you have for your, your faith? Well, I want to tell you, the Bible is here to answer all these questions. If you would, look at verse 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, he's reminding them, and he says back in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I want you to be on guard. Matter of fact, if you would look there real quick, he says, know this, that in the last days, perilous or dangerous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It says in verse 5, they will have a form of godliness but deny its power. And so Paul tells Timothy, from such people, turn away. Turn away. See, during the last days, he says, evil is going to increase. Not only is it going to increase, but it's going to become normalized. And so because of that, he says, listen, you have to be aware of these false teachers because they have a form of godliness but deny its power. And so what we see in verse 13 of chapter 1, Paul tells Timothy that you need to stand firm and stand fast. You need to hold on and stay focused. And remember the sound words that you've heard from me, Paul says, in faith and love which are in Christ. And so what Paul does, he goes on, he says, listen, I've been an example to you, Timothy, of how you should live. Look at verse 10 of chapter 3. It says, you've carefully followed my doctrine, manner of love, a life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, and afflictions. Carefully means this, you followed my life step by step. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says this, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. See, Timothy had traveled with Paul, heard his teachings, served alongside him, watched his life, and took note of his works. He used Paul's life as an example, and Paul said, use my life as an example. But be careful. Don't turn away. Don't move in any different direction. And as he used Paul's life as an example, and as Paul's life, he trusted Christ in everything. Timothy, follow this. You know the way you've been taught. Now, I had the privilege to go into a lot of the local schools and do Christian club Bible studies weekly. So I, I, this week that just passed, I was at three different schools, and uh, every week I get to go to a different school and, and share the, the word. And this past week I was speaking about this. The, the students asked me to talk about how can we as Christians help other Christians that we know that are choosing to live a worldly life come out of that. It's a pretty awesome conversation, right, that high schoolers are asking that. And so as we begin to talk, this young man says, can I ask you some questions? And so he began to ask me questions, and it's hard because it's just lunchtime, and he's saying, I don't mean to be offensive. And he says, I grew up in the church, and I was raised in a Christian home. I went to a Christian school for three years. I took apologetics classes and all these things. I know the Bible, but doesn't the Bible say this, and doesn't the Bible say that? And he goes on, and I'm answering his questions, and he went on to tell me that though he was raised in the church, he goes, I don't believe in the Bible right now, and I don't believe that God exists. And I said, why? And he went on to tell me the reason was that 
As he struggles with life and different things, his dad told him things, and, and his dad has since... Sorry. <laughs> his, hello? Oh, there we are. <laughs> Sorry. His dad disowned him. His dad was the one who raised him in the church, but he, he said this to me. He says, I, I thought Christians, aren't they supposed to be the embodiment of Christ and live like Christ? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, I have nothing but abuse when it comes to Christians. And as a youth minister, my heart just sank and broke. He's a young man. And his view of God, again, he was raised in a church. I don't know which one. He didn't say, but he was raised in a church. And he was raised in a Christian home, and he says, I've had nothing but abuse. And I've seen nothing healthy of Jesus in the Bible out, lived out of people. And he says, including my parents. And I have to tell you, my heart sank. And I was answering questions, and it was one of the first times I could see in his face that he's like, wow. Maybe, and I told him, you can't let people rip you off from seeing who Christ is. And he said, but it's hard because all I've seen is, in the name of Christ, bad things. And so we exchange numbers and pray because in the next week or two, we're going to go to take him to lunch and hopefully answers questions and help minister to this young man. But the thing is, is this, is Paul says to Timothy, you've seen a good example, not only me, but if you look in chapter one, he says also you were raised in this with your mom and your grandmother. And so you have great examples. And so one of the reasons why he wouldn't turn away, why he could stay in the faith, is because he knows by who he has learned these things. Look at verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from who you learned them from. He says not only that you've learned them from me, Paul would say, but you've also learned them from your, your mother and your grandmother. And there's something about these people, his mother, his grandmother, and Paul, that says, I know that God is real. I know that God is real because I've seen Christ lived out in these people. And I wonder if the people around you see Christ lived out. The hope, the hope that's an anchor for our soul, grace, love, mercy, all the things that God has given us. And so here's the thing. We're talking about equipping people in Christ, and the whole point of that is the Scriptures do just that. Notice it says in verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, it says every part, every Scripture is God-breathed. Paul says that God breathed out of man his holy word. Paul exhorted Timothy, continue things because the Bible comes from God and not from man. It is a God-inspired book, breathe out from God himself. The Bible's claim to be Holy Scripture has been tested and proven through the centuries. See, the Bible outlives and outworks and outinfluences all of its critics. Charles Spurgeon says this, if we are left in doubt as to which is inspired and which is not, we, we are so badly off as if we have no Bible at all. I hold no theory of inspiration except the inspiration of the Scriptures as a fact. See, the Bible is a collection of 66 writings that were penned by more than 40 authors on three continents over a 1,500 year period. Now we know that God's word is not only inspired, but it's prophetic. God told his writers that I will put my word in your mouth. Second Peter chapter one, verse 19 through 21, it says this, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in darkness until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this verse that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never comes by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, the apostles themselves recognized their writings as inspired and not authoritative. Colossians 4.16 says this, Now when the epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which you are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist in their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. 
Well, as we know that God's word is prophetic, God's ability to precisely predict future events in the Bible is one of his own ways of building proof for the Bible right in his own text. It proves that it was, author, it was authored by someone who not only can see the future, but who can also shape the future. For example, there are at least 332 distinct Old Testament predictions regarding the Messiah, which Jesus fulfilled. His birth in Bethlehem, his healing of the sick, his, his death on the cross, and so forth. Over and over again, the authors of the Bible rightly foretold the future events, oftentimes hundreds of years in advance. The Bible is literally filled with hundreds of specific details prophesying about persons, places, and events. A professor, Peter Stoner, in his book, has calculated the probability of any one man fulfilling eight of these prophecies. He says, in that, it would be one in 10 to the 17th power. It's been said that that many silver dollars would cover the state of Texas two feet deep. Stoner also went on to say that if you consider 48 of the prophecies, the odd becomes one in 10 to the 157th power, and yet Jesus fulfilled all of these. We have evidence of the existence of the Bible, and yet what do we do with it? In in an article in the Barna Group, it says this, With over 5 billion copies sold, the Bible remains Earth's most read book. But the world in which we read and engage with the Bible is rapidly changing. The steady rise of skepticism is creating a culture atmosphere that is becoming unfriendly to claims of faith. The adoption of uh, self-fulfillment as our culture's ultimate measure of good is reorienting moral authority. And the explosive growth of digital tools such as Bible apps, daily reading plans, study resources, and online uh, communities offer unprecedented access to the scriptures. In other words, he's saying we have the scriptures, but what do we do with them? See, a lot of us believe in the Bible as inspired by God, but only in principle because in practice we deny it. We do this by imposing our own meaning on the text. We do this by being more interested in opinions. My question to you this morning is this. To you, is the Bible one, just a book? Is the Bible an important book or is the Bible the book? You know, it's interesting because in reading some of the statistics and different things about people's beliefs in the Bible... It was saying that less than 50% of all people who would read the Bible on a weekly basis believe that it's actually God's inspired word. What are we doing with it? We're reading the Bible, but we're not letting it change us. Can you imagine all of us in this room, and we had first service earlier, and can you imagine all of us living out God's word, how we can impact this community if we all actually lived out God's word? how we can impact our workplaces, our families, our homes, our schools, all of us, not just us, but those in our youth ministry right now and others, living it out, not just studying it, not just reading it, but applying it. See, Paul was confident of Timothy's commitment to and dependence on the scriptures, and was even more confident of God's ability to supply all Timothy's needs through, the, through his word. Notice it says in verse 16 that it's given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. He said it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8 says bodily exercise profits a little but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the love, of the life that now is and of that which is to come. And so here, He declares the purpose of the Bible. It's profitable for us. And I just think so often as a youth minister, you know, one of the things that I do as a youth minister uh, here at the church, we do this thing often called face-to-face. We started this years ago and we stopped it for a little bit. We just started picking it back up. And what it is, is we have a group discussion with the high schoolers. I love this. It's one of my favorite things. The reason why it's one of my favorite things is because this, oftentimes, I'm always the one teaching, and the students don't get a chance to respond. So I ask them questions, and we spend that time 
conversating. For example, one of the questions we asked is this. We actually spent a three-hour discussion on this question. I opened with one question, and it's getting to be about that time of year anyway, so it's a good question. Parents, listen to it. Is it okay to take a non-Christian to prom? Why or why not? Ooh. Three hours. And it opened up with one of the young men going, I don't think it's a problem. We're just friends. It's not like we're going to get married or anything. We're like, we're just in high school. We're just having fun. So I go, okay, girls, you spend a lot of money on the dress, on your nails and doing your hair and all that stuff. Is there something inside you that hopes he notices you? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, well, it kind of killed your argument there. So I asked the question, so what happens if you guys actually start liking each other after prom or during prom? And all of a sudden, you guys are like looking at each other going, wow, I never thought you were attractive, but now that you're dressed up, you kind of are. <laughs> and then you start dating. And two years later, when you want to get married, you're, instead of getting married, you say, I have to break up with you. Why? Because you're not a Christian. And the Bible says, don't be equally yoked. And we were just having fun. It was just a high school fling. And I wasn't supposed to ever give my heart to you, so I got to go. Or do you just marry them because you're in love now? Interesting, huh? Here's another one. We just had this one recently. And listen, this is all inside the youth group. This isn't like at the public school and stuff. This is here. This is an interesting one for you. Is it okay to listen to secular music? Why or why not? Oh, the argument that, in, that came about with that. Some are like, I asked the question, how many of you grew up in a Christian home and all you're allowed to do is listen to Christian music? And many of them raise their hand. And I go, now, out of those who raise your hand, how many of you listen to secular music? And a few were honest. I'm not going to tell you which ones. <laughs> That's between them and the Lord. <laughs> and here's one of the things. I was like, well, test them. What do you think? And I often tell them this. It doesn't matter what I think. What does the Bible say? When it came to the dating thing, what does the Bible say? And... I always end the conversation with, what does the Bible say? And it isn't one of those things. And so, I mean, as a parent, maybe some of you were like, do as I say, not as I do. Listen, if you've ever said that to your kids, just make sure you understand you're wrong, right? We're all okay with that. Like, I'm wrong. Like, that's not how it works, right? If you can't be, Paul says, follow my lead. We have to say that too, right? But here's the thing. I ask, how, how close do you want to be to Jesus? Well, you know what? The, the music doesn't bother me. It's not like I listen to the words. I just like the beat. And so normally what I'll do is I'll start singing a song, even a secular song, <laughs> or sing a TV tune or something. And I said, as soon as you catch on, follow my lead. And so all of a sudden, everybody in the room, even the Christian kids, they grew up in the church and aren't allowed to listen to secular music or singing along. And I said, so it doesn't affect you at all, huh? Well, no. <laughs> we have so much influence coming in. How do we stand against those things? What are we supposed to do with that? Well, the first thing he says is we should know doctrine. Doctrine meaning what is right. Doctrine is his teaching concerning the person and message of Jesus Christ. Doctrine is our basic foundational beliefs about God, man, life, death, and the future. One of the things that's important for us is this. We need to understand that our belief produces our behavior. And we can't allow belief to turn into opinion. That's one of the biggest things. Well, I don't think God is like this. Okay, where did you get your answer from? Is it that you just don't want to believe that God is a certain way because of your lifestyle? At Don Lugo, when I was in high school, I had one of our favorite teachers. He said this to us students. He says, I believe in the Bible. I just pick and choose what I believe. Wow. Wouldn't that be great if we could do that? But what do you pick and what do you choose? What do you throw out? What do you keep? Notice in verse 12, it says, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Not me. I don't believe in that verse. 
I'm not going to read that in my promises from God. Nope. <laughs> so do you believe in the Old Testament? And you're like, I have all these wives, man, because the Bible says it's okay. <laughs> like, it's interesting how we can interpret things according to our own opinion. And he says, don't do that. See, Scripture prepares us for a life of service. You can't want to live a Christian life and never read the Bible. Matter of fact, D.L. Moody says this, the Bible will keep you from sin and sin will keep you from the Bible. And that's true. You ever just feel so guilty because you haven't been walking with God like you know you should? And you want to even open up your Bible, but you're like, I can't. I just don't feel worthy. And then you finally do, and you open up the scriptures to pages that you last left off, or like Romans chapter 5, where God says, God so loved the world that he demonstrated his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And then you begin to weep, because you're reminded of Ephesians chapter 2 that says that you're saved by grace through faith and not of your works. And you're reminded of the love of God that he chose you before the foundation of the world, that he redeemed you, that your identity is found in Christ because of Christ, and that's your hope, not your works, his work for you, that you receive his love. Isn't that a powerful thing? And so when we find our identity and our hope in Christ and we find it in his word, but see, false and compromised doctrine will produce spiritually weak people. Jesus made this clear when warning against a yielding to false teachers. In Matthew chapter 7, he says this in verse 15 to 20, Beware of false prophets who come in to you in sheep's clothing, but in inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, their fruits you will know. Listen, God gives us a remedy for deception. It's this, study his word, meditate on it. Matter of fact, in the scriptures, it reminds us this in Matthew chapter 28. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen, the Lord didn't tell us, listen, go around and make sure you can get 1,500 people to bow their head and close their eyes and say a sinner's prayer. And then you can put on your Facebook and your Instagram, man, I prayed with 30 people today, 50 people yesterday, and they're all new Christians. How do you know they're new Christians? How do you know? If you're going to start and stop there, listen, we're missing the most important part, teaching them, equipping them. I remember when I was in Bible college, I was talking to my friend Sumo, and I asked him, sorry, he recently passed, and, but I asked him, I said, um, hey, I, I want to be discipled, and he's a big Hawaiian guy, so he punches me. <laughs> We're driving, and he reaches over, and he punches me. He goes, what do you mean you've never been disciple? <laughs> and I go, you've been discipled, and name some friends. I go, well, they've been discipled. Nobody's discipled me. And he's like, what? At the time, we were roommates in college. At the time, he was my pastor at Hope Chapel in Ontario. At the time, when it came to ministry, I did everything with him. He'd go on hospital visits. I would go with him. and We surfed all the time together. We would do everything together. And he started pointing those things out, and I didn't realize what discipleship was and wasn't. I had been discipled. I thought it was him sitting down with a book and me saying, do this, do that. What it was was him living for Christ and saying, watch what we do for Christ. And it's interesting because now, like Josh Collins, who's our junior high minister, I learned from sumo. So the way I discipled Josh was I had a mountain bike, and then I got Josh on a mountain bike, and we'd go up to Claremont and ride our mountain bikes, and we'd hang out. 
And then when I guest speak somewhere, he would come with me. And then uh, one of the best places I think to disciple is surfing in the water. <laughs> one of the best places to be is in the water, right? <laughs> and so we'd surf. Since then, I, I've hurt my neck, and so I don't mountain bike anymore. But I gave my bike to Josh, and now he takes people mountain biking. And he takes people surfing. And when he guest speaks, people go with him. And we're learning how to pass the baton and say, live for Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Because it's not just about being in the word, it's about living out the word. And it's not about being perfect, it's about saying, listen, even Paul says, listen, the things I do, I wish I, wish I didn't do, and the things I did, I, I, or vice, the things I do, I wish I didn't do, and the things I didn't do, I wish I did. He calls himself the chief of all sinners. And yet what he says is this, watch me get up and watch me press forward. Watch me run to Jesus. The word of God gives us the ability to discern and resist deception. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14, that you should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. He says in 2 Corinthians 2 17, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God. We speak in the sight of God in Christ. He says, Timothy, you follow what is right, my right teaching. But he says also for reproof. The word of God is for reproof or what is not right, for rebuking. See, the scriptures are capable of rebuking those who are not obeying its commandments. The, the Bible speaks to us poignantly concerning those things in our lives which are displeasing to God. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8, do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and then he will love you. Now, I don't know about you, I hate being corrected. Yet at the same time, I love it. Because I want to do what's right. I want to honor and please God. It hurts. It hurts when your sin is brought to the surface, and especially when you're being called out. But even as a high school minister, I've sat with my leaders and I've told them, listen, if I'm wrong, call me out. Just make sure you respect me and love me. But I love you, so I'm going to say the same. Because I want to be in God's will and I want to do what's right. And so if I'm heading down the wrong path or the wrong direction, please call me out. Because if you love me, you do that. If you don't, you won't. Ephesians 4.15 says, but speaking the truth in love that you may grow up in all things into him who is the head. So not only by the doctrine of reproof, but he says in correction. So not only what is right, what is not right, but now how to get right. See, the scriptures also provide correction. They answer the question, how can a person who is not doing the will of God correct his life and make it correspond to the will of God? See, God has revealed himself to man through the scriptures, and yet, man, we have our own conception of God. And oftentimes it differs uh, from God's revelation of himself. But God wants to lead us and direct us. Paul reminded Timothy, invest in the scriptures. And again, it's not just knowing what's wrong, but here he's saying, I want to show you what's right and how to get right. And to walk in truth. Matter of fact, in John chapter 8, it says this in verse 31 to 32. If you abide in my word and you are my disciples indeed, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. In 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Or 3 John chapter 1, verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. Last Wednesday, I had, or this past Wednesday that just passed, Actually, the last two Wednesdays. Two Wednesdays ago, I had one of my high school leaders teach for me. Did an amazing job. First time teaching. Feels called to be a youth minister. I was like, let's see what you got. <laughs> let's let the Lord speak to you and through you. Did an amazing job. This past Wednesday, for the second time, I had a high schooler teach. And, and I stole his notes. <laughs> Honestly, he's one of the best teachers I've ever heard. So thoughtful and such an incredible teaching. I literally told him, I'm like, I'm still in your notes. And I'm going to teach this study as if it was mine because it was that good. 
I won't, no, I'll give him credit. <laughs> sitting there, taking notes, sitting in the high school room, watching somebody else at the pulpit I use every week, somebody that you've been pouring into, teaching, and I think teaching better than I could, there's no greater joy. That this young man, they get it. They get it. Listen, last weekend our junior high went to, to camp. 70 of them. I wasn't a Christian in junior high. Some of you weren't. Some of you thought you were. No. <laughs> and this past Wednesday, they all came in and Josh spent the, the, that service letting the junior high share what God spoke to them. So these Students, junior hires, opened up their journals from camp and began to share what God was speaking to them. How they feel called by God and how they feel loved by God and how they felt secured by the scriptures about the hope that they have in Christ and all this stuff. Isn't that amazing? Man, that we would just get it. That we would understand that God's word tells us that we're loved, that we're chosen, that we've been redeemed. It is grace and love and mercies for all of us. But it's not just hearing that, it's applying that. We have to apply that to our lives. The fourth thing that he says, that the scriptures are there for instruction and righteousness. So not only what's right, what's not right, how to get right, but here, the fourth thing, how to stay right. See, the word of God instructs us on how to live in true righteousness. See, Paul understood this because Before his conversion, it was all about his outward task, right? It was all about look at me and look at who I've been taught by and look at all these things that I've done and look at who I am. But in the book of Philippians, he says all that is rubbish. It's trash. Matter of fact, in the book of Philippians, he says this in chapter 3. He says, verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to apprehend it, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I pressed toward the goal of the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. He understood now what he has to live for and what he's moving towards. So that when we see in chapter 4 here, Timothy, when he tells Timothy, I fought the good fight, I finished the race. Because he didn't only teach Timothy how to live, he taught Timothy how to finish well. And how to stick to the scriptures. And what mattered most. Well, the fifth thing. He says this, that the man of God may be complete in verse 17. That word complete means mature. That we might come into a spiritual maturity. Again, the word complete means the Bible leads me into everything I need. The Bible will not only make you wise for salvation, it says in verse 15, but make you well equipped for every situation. See, the book of James tells us this in chapter 1, verse 21 to 25. It says, lay aside all filthiness and overflow wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, And is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Again, he says, listen, as a believer, you'll be complete as both a hearer and a doer. Because God is going to help us to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. As we look at this, one of the things I want to point out to you is that the Bible isn't just about information. It's about transformation. Every builder needs an architect, and the Bible is God's blueprint for our lives. In Romans chapter 12, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible transforms us. I don't know about you, but I know I don't think the same like I used to. I'm so thankful for that. I look at people differently. I look at life differently ever since I gave my life to Christ. It's not always easy. But it's interesting because when we have such a misunderstanding of God's word, we we think like, well, you know, we're Christians now. Everything's going to be piece of cake, right? And yet we, I read to you verse 12 where it says, all those in Christ will suffer persecution. 
Or how about in the Gospels when Jesus says, hey, you guys, let's get in the boats and go across. The storm comes up and everybody's mad at Jesus because he's sleeping in the boat. And he wakes up and he says to the storm, peace be still. He calms the storm, but he looks at the guys and says, why are you doubting? I told you we're going to the other side. Why are you doubting my word to you? And so often, again, I read to you statistics that say less than 50% of people who read the Bible weekly believe it as God's actual inspired word. God breathed. We're not letting it change us because we don't believe it could. But we know it could. We have to just put our trust in him. It's been proven to us that it works. One of the reasons I love the Bible so much is it, it is a matter of fact. It does tell us we're going to suffer. And I don't like that. But I like the fact that it tells us that we're going to go through hard times. So we're not caught off guard. I've seen so many people, maybe you have too, walk away from Christ. Well, God wasn't there when I needed him. Really? Because the Bible says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, but he let me go through this hard time. But you're equating the hard time as if God left. That's not what the word teaches. He says he's with us even in hard times. Even through trials. And yet we walk away. Because it's easier sometimes not even to care. It's easier sometimes just to give up and quit rather than surrender and trust God and trust him for who he is. Listen. The Bible says that we will be thoroughly equipped. That, word, that phrase thoroughly equipped means to furnish perfectly. We're equipped fully. And as I mentioned, Paul was confident of Timothy's commitment to and dependence on the scripture. And again, he was more confident of God's ability to supply all Timothy's needs through his word. And notice what it says in conclusion. It says, for every good work. We're to stand strong and to stay in the word during these last days. The word of God in our hearts will keep us from the power of sin. The Bible says this in Psalm 119, verse 9 through 11. How can a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Listen. So often we find our identity in different things. And we label ourselves different things. I don't know about you, but I mean, I've labeled myself a surfer, a mountain biker, or this guy, or that guy, and whatever's. But we're children of God, and if children, then heirs. And we have a promise. And our promise, according to the scriptures, is a, is a hope, it's an anchor for our soul. It's sure and steadfast, and it doesn't fade away, and it doesn't drift away. God's word keeps us from being tossed to and fro. God's word keeps us, and it keeps us strong, and it helps us to go through life each and every day. And yet, we read it, we come week in and week out, and we hear it. But my question to you is this. Is the Bible to you a book? Is it an important book, or is it the book? Is it everything that you need? Are you allowing it to change your life? Are you hearing it? reading it, taking it in, but are you applying it? God wants us to live out his word, to trust him. The Bible declares that his word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And you might say, but God, I don't know the way. And he goes, I got you. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to light the way. But it doesn't seem like this is the way because it's hard. I didn't tell you the, the way is going to be easy. I just told you I was going to be with you on the way. Remember, in Paul's conversion, the Lord told him, I'm going to show him all the things he must suffer for my name's sake, but I'm going to be with him. I'm going to use him. I've got great plans in store for him. And here's the thing I want to finish with this. God has great plans for you too. See, I never 
if, if you go back to the days I got saved and all that stuff and you picture me up here now, you'd be like, if you go back to Bible college days and you pick, I had hair down to here and I had these fuchsia corduroy pants I used to like to wear. I got it from the thrift store and stuff and all these things. And I, I would French braid my hair, wear pippy long stocking like hair and stuff just because I wanted to. And I was just this weirdo. Still am. That's why I apologize in the beginning. <laughs> But God's word changed my life. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you this morning. But I remember telling God, I want to be used by you. I want, Lord, here's my life. And when you're willing, he's willing. You have to just trust his word. And so... I just want to end by saying, for you and I, may we pray that God would give us a hunger and a thirst for his word, a desire to not only read it, but apply it. And may we live out his word like Paul did with Timothy and show people, follow me as I follow Christ. And when you fall, get up. If you see somebody around you fall, pick them up. (laughs) Let's pray together and let's live for Christ.